Good morning, friends, family, beloved. Good morning and welcome to this Sunday's Parkway Baptist Church Worship Service Live. We thank you so much for joining us this morning. As we gather together, we come uh, prayerful for those who need prayer, who need to be comforted. As we gather this morning, we come to pray for this nation that is still uh, uh, divided and, and racked in turmoil. As Paul once said, that none of these things uh, faze me, none of these things bother me. Paul was talking about his own life journey. He was saying, and you know Paul's journey, uh, he had been uh, stoned three times, he had been jailed, uh, he had been whipped, uh, he had been shipwrecked, and he was describing that none of those things disturbed him because his eye was on the prize. So we gather this morning, we keep our eye on Jesus. He is truly the author and the finish of our faith. Will you please join me now to begin with a moment of prayer. Dear God, our Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day you've made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, because it's on Christ, the solid rock, we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We come this morning, we declare that we decide, have made a decision to follow Jesus all the way. There will be no turning back. The world behind us and the cross before us we have decided to go with Jesus all the way. We're not going to go with government. We're not going to go with the with, with principalities of this world, but only the principalities of heaven and his angels. We look to you, God, this morning. You, the, the, the comforter, uh, the great settler, uh, the, the, the great redeemer, the great I am, that you can be all things to all people and, who stand and call upon your name. Bless us as we begin this worship service this morning. You know what your people stand in need of as they listen over the phones, as they join us online, God. You have your way, Lord, to touch and agree, to meet the needs of your people. We're asking for special blessing, God, that only you can give us, that the world can't take away from us. We ask God that this worship service be edifying and encouraging to people who are <laughs> listeners and viewers this morning. May the word go forward, God, and not come back void. May somebody be touched. May lives be transformed. May one somebody say, what must I do to be saved, to receive the joy of the Lord as their strength? Bless every move and maybe message we say this morning, and you'll get all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And amen. Amen again. Amen. Amen for the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise amen. the Lord. We're going to ask Brother Minister uh, Chuck Jennings now to come forward and uh, render a selection for us. Comfort I get from God's own word. 
know from the rock. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brother Jenny. Amen. Thank you so much. Brothers and sisters, I invite you now to open up your Bibles. Uh, open up your Bibles and join me in this morning reading. We'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, the 16th chapter, verses 16 through 31. Gospel of Luke in the 16th chapter. A very familiar text. It's a story about the rich man and Lazarus. It reads as follows. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate lay a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead comes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Mm. I want to talk to us this morning from the subject of Day of Reckoning. This parable of the rich man and Lazarus is often used to attack the problem of the rich and poor in America. I want to suggest to you this morning, this parable has a greater purpose than to talk about the wealth gap. We know money talks, but God's voice is much larger. And if you only see this story from the lens of the rich and the poor, you will miss the bigger picture of God's message. Parables tell the truth about us. The truth can hurt, or the truth can set one free. The truth is, most people don't see things as they are. They see things as they are. In other words, most people see things in the world from their own point of view. People build a model of the world and impose that model on the world as they see it. Pastor Paul said when he's talking to the uh, Christians in Corinth, in that 13th chapter of Corinthians, he says, now we see but a poor reflection as it is in the mirror. Then we'll see face to face. What Paul was suggesting is that poor eyesight leads to gross insight and oversight. Usually we see others from our own point of view and not from theirs. And that's an oversight. We have our own frame of reference. We take our assumptions and our perceptions and we create a picture in our own mind. When they take that created picture, they put it into a frame and, and that frame is, is shaped. It, it becomes self-contained, it becomes fixed. And we don't go beyond that frame. We all know people whose frame of reference is they see the world half empty and, and not half full. And that's the way they've shaped it and framed it. That becomes their narrative. The problem with the rich is not so much his wealth. The problem was how his perceptions of himself influence his perceptions of others. Dr. Cornel West has elegantly described his flaw and perceptions as our normative gaze. 
Then we see others in relation to the position of our privilege, position, and power. The problem comes because we normalize these perceptions and to the point we no longer question them. We affirm them, we rubber stamp them. The sin of the rich man is that he didn't see Lazarus. He didn't see him as any extension of himself and his own needs. This rich man's normative gaze was that he was destined, you see, to, to be great, to be privileged. And that the beggar's lot in life was destined to be poor. Text says that the rich man dressed himself every day in, in, in fine clothes. And when he saw the beggar's gate, he ignored him. And from the rich man's point of reference, it was all about himself. He's the master of his universe. He, he, he's so self-consumed. It's been said that the closer to the problem or the situation uh, one is, that they're closer also to the solution. But that's not the case here. And I want to give you three reasons why the rich man was a problem in search of a solution. The first thing is, he was burnt out. Admittedly, we have to take at face value that uh, Jesus doesn't tell us a lot about these two men and their way of life. But we do have some clues and indications. For instance, uh, we must consider that the rich man was very rich. He wore purple. Purple is, is symbolic of the finest wares that one can acquire. Purple associated with royalty. And he lived in a lap of luxury, suggesting that he had abundance of everything and he ate sumptuously. He shopped in, in, in Whole Foods and in, in Wegmans. But to keep up his appearances, how challenging, how, how stressful it was uh, to live high on the hog, and how much a toll it must have taken on him. The other man, Lazarus, was a beggar, and he longed to satisfy his hunger and get healing for the sores of his body. For the rich man's point of view, the paths of these two were never intended to cross. Seeing Lazarus every day no doubt bothered him and, and, and stressed him. Uh, because he was so self-absorbed. This pandemic has taken a toll on all of us. I mean, one of us has been impacted either directly or indirectly from it. We have been inundated by news flashes of bad reports across our TV screens. Our, our lives have been disrupted. We have been inconvenienced. And so when you see a situation at your door, in your face, you don't often see an opportunity these days, you see a problem. You don't mean it to be that way, but we have become cynical. When the problem's in your face, you know, we have a tendency to be condescending, dismissive. You, you can become careless and less compassionate. Even though we know too much is given, much is required, you're feeling burnt out. Compassion fatigue is setting in. You, you feel low in spirit. You, uh, you feel sap of energy. Remember the parable Jesus tells of the Good Samaritan. You've seen a man beat down on the road. And as they're going to his aid, you look the other way. You pretend he doesn't exist. In our text this morning, this sick man who was hungry was at the front door of the homeowner every day. And what happens is the more we see a problem, the less we see it as a problem to us. We begin to normalize it. We condition ourselves to believe that's just the way life is. Mm -hmm. Lazarus longed to satisfy his hunger uh, with food that fell from the rich man's table. Interestingly enough, we, we're told that the dogs came to lick his sores. See, usually dogs eat the scraps under the table. I think this is in there because Jesus is implying that the rich man saw Lazarus lower than the dogs. So the big picture is it, it, not just because Lazarus was poor and sick. He, he's just a symptom of a larger problem in America. The, the poverty of humanity. Yes, we've grown cold. We've grown indifferent. You see, before the pandemic, there was approximately 40 million people in this country living in poverty. That number now has undoubtedly climbed, just like the virus has climbed and surged. 
Instead of guaranteeing universal health care for all people, especially during a time of a crisis, the leadership of this nation has petitioned the high court to abolish the Affordable Care Act and has no other replacement for it. I submit to you he's burnt out. And, and, and is there a solution? A person is burnt out to seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. To pray for direction. Lean not to one's own understanding, but acknowledge God in all your ways. He'll direct your path. Yes, with God there's no quick fix. But he is the way, the truth, and the life. With God, you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. He'll make you able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can imagine or think, according to the power that's already given unto you. Yes, Jesus said that uh, we must feed the hungry. We must clothe the naked. We must visit those in prison. That we do things for the least of these that we'll do unto him. We should see the world, in other words, the way Jesus sees the world see each other as a chance to serve others, uh, be the hands and feet of Jesus. Burnt out people are, are not blessing to anyone. Yes, the second reason why the rich man was a, a, a problem in search of a solution, not only was because he was burnt out, but he was living in a bubble. A bubble is an artificial world. It's a world where you draw a circle around yourself. You can see outside the circle, but you have this kind of protective layer that buffers you from those on the outside. People who live in a bubble see themselves apart from the world. Uh, we can see all things going on in the world, uh, but we shelter ourselves from it so we're not affected by it. The rich man lived in a bubble. He had his home, he had his health, he had his clothes, and, and his cars, his possession. It allowed him to socially distance himself from last week. You know, recently it was announced that the National Basketball Association was going to have a basketball season this year in spite of the pandemic. Their plan was to, uh, their plan is to start uh, uh, basketball training in Disney World, Florida. And that all the players would be required to sign an agreement to remain in this bubble during the training season. In other words, they will be forbidden from leaving that site. They will have to shelter in place, uh, allow themselves to remain uh, away from the world uh, at the risk, you see, of, of either contracting or spreading the virus. Not only will they have to shelter there, but no one can come visit them. Their families, their wives, their children are forbidden to visit. To visit. Several players. Some of them from the WNBA, the female uh, basketball league, have refused to sign up because they have suddenly become very active in the Black Lives Matter movement. They have suddenly become very active in, in protests for, for police reform. And they have decided to put aside their self-interest for the interest of the greater good. You can't serve two masters. Uh, they have said that their priority now is justice. The rich man, you see, remained in the bubble because his priority was his own interest. And the problem with the rich man was that he had accepted the terms and conditions of the bubble. He had agreed to play ball with the system. The system wants him to perpetuate this us against them, the haves against the have-nots. The system, you see, thrives on division, not unity. It's dragging the people in the bubble is to win by, by dividing and not by uniting. Yes, churches can be like a bubble if they're not careful. Christians, you see, want to shelter in place. They, they rather treat, treat the church as a, a safe haven against the outer world. Churches can function like a bubble if, they, if they're like a, a club where you need an exclusive membership to join. Churches can function like bubbles when they stop evangelizing. It, it, it becomes a us against them. This pandemic has actually burst the bubble, whether we know it or not. The church is no longer a building. 
The church is no longer a, 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 a place where people for, can find comfort and, 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 and just huddle. No, the church is beyond the walls now. Amen. It's time to be the real light to the world and a salt to the earth. It's time to stop hiding one's light under the house and under the bed. It, it let your light shine. We cannot accept the terms and the conditions of, of sheltering in place. We, we cannot play ball with the system and accept business as usual. We need to get outside the bubble. We need to think outside the box. Yes, the third problem. Not only was he burnt out, not only was he living in a bubble, but this rich man's problem is he had a blind spot. You see, we can be blind to the truth. The truth is that we all have fallen short of God's glory. That none of us is righteous. I started this sermon by talking about how people see things from their own point of view. And we can see uh, the speck, you see, in the eye of someone else, but we don't see the boulder in our own eye. We can be blind as a bat to our own faults. Jesus illustrates this so poignantly in the, in the story he tells between a taxpayer and a Pharisee. Both men went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee prayed to God, Lord, I, I thank you. I'm not like other people. I thank you, I'm good. I'm not a thief, I pay my taxes, I, I fast twice a week, I, I pay my tithes faithfully. I thank you that I'm not like other people. In a distance off was this tax collector who prayed also. He prayed, God have mercy on me. I'm a sinner, I, I've fallen short of the glory. Jesus tells this story to show us that the Pharisee was so sanctimonious, so self-righteous, uh, and so full of himself that even his religious devotions blinds him, doesn't justify him. It only causes him to have contempt for others. Rich man felt so exalted that he saw Lazarus that so low down and beneath him, contemptible. The more he saw Lazarus, the more contempt he had for Lazarus. And the worst of it all, he thought nothing was wrong with his benign neglect. Yes, believing that doing nothing to help Nazareth, Nazareth was the best way to be helpful. God gives us time to self-correct. He gives us chances to set things in order. Yes, thank you. But eventually, God loses his patience with us. Mm -hmm. No matter how high you sit on earthly thrones, no matter how you feel you're Teflon and you're untouchable, this text says that they come. When the reckoning comes, here, here, Lazarus died. And they came when the rich man died. You know, the truth is, my friends, and we're not going to live in this flesh forever. Hebrew 9, 27 says, it's an appointed time unto all men once to die, and after that, the judgment. That death is unavoidable. That we ought to understand, my friends, teach us to number our days so we can apply our heart to wisdom. Because death has an appointment. We all have a number. No one is exempt. It doesn't matter how much earthly treasures you require. It doesn't matter how many hotels, homes, and golf courses, and bank accounts you have bearing your name. Everyone has an appointed time. And after death, the judgment. In other words, do you realize, my friends, it doesn't die at your death. You can't escape your destiny. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, you know, your death is just the door to your destiny. The deeds done in this life will follow you and follow me. Here Lazarus was carried to Abraham's side. The rich man died and his home was in hell. The truth is everyone is going to reap what they sow. Those who sow sparingly will reap sparingly. Yes, your past will eventually catch up with you. Whatever comes around, goes around. Jesus says, whosoever you do for the least of these, you do to me. Jesus said, whosoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. There are not too passages, not too many passages in the Bible that are so descriptive about uh, the hellish 
nature of hell as this text we're reading from this morning. The rich man looked up from hell and saw Abraham far off with Lazarus by his side. He said, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Which suggests to me that this rich man recognized Abram as the father of faith. He knew him. <laughs> you know, my friends, Jesus says this thing. So many call my name, but their heart is far from me. You got to know him for yourself. Don't just give a lip service. There comes a time when you played your hand out. There comes a time when all excuses have gone dry. And God says, enough. The rich man asked Abraham to allow Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger into water to cool his tongue, to ease up some of the agony and the pain he was going through. Here, the tables have turned. The lowly Lazarus has been lifted high to a lofty place, and the rich man has fallen from grace. The reckoning had begun, and there was no turning back. Now there was this great chasm between Lazarus and the rich man. You know, I read about the, uh, uh, the unsearchable reach of God. When you read Psalm uh, 139, he tells there, he begins, he says, I search you, I've known you. I've known you from, your, uh, from the time you were born. I've known your uprising and your down city. He knows all about it. He searched us. You read that 38, that, that the 8th verse, he says, even when, when the psalmist says, even if I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Can you imagine? I take that to mean, my friends, that the existence of God is everywhere. He's inescapable. Whether one is in paradise, or one is in Hades. God has rule and sovereign over all things. It's God who puts a rich man in, in hell for failing to love his neighbor as he loved himself. That great chasm is the way Jesus describes when he's talking about the, separate, the day there's going to be a, a separation between the sheep and the goats. That God will judge the evil from the good. That those destined for, for eternal damnation and there'll be others who will be destined for eternal glory. Right now, America is going through a reckoning moment. And one illustration of this, my friends, is how we're treating these statues, these monuments, these pillars, these symbols of, of hatred, of racism, and injustice. This morning, I woke up to hear that Woodrow Wilson, who, who was the former governor of this state, who became a president of this nation, who was also a diehard racist, his, his name was removed from the building of, on, on Princeton University. This action, mind you, coincides uh, with the university, Princeton University's first African-American valedictorian. God is using a spiritual wrecking ball to tear down the devil's kingdom. He's using it to raise up his kingdom. Yes, the lowly are coming up and the mighty are coming down. It doesn't matter. Uh, whether you're dead or alive, God is going to make it right. Yes, whatever you've done in the dark is going to come to light. The lies cannot live forever. God's going to turn things around. Somebody this morning needs to hear this. Somebody this morning needs to take this to heart. The clock is ticking on their life. It's time to get right with God. Your failure to repent and accept Jesus as your Savior will not only put you into the, into the fiery pit. This text concludes where the rich man asks Abraham to spare his brothers, show mercy on them. In other words, do you realize, my friend, your decision whether you accept the Lord not only affects your life, but it affects your family. Don't destroy them, redeem them. Start today to accept them as your savior. Be an example for them so others will follow. He will not send out a rescue boat for you. Now is the time. Today is the day for the reckoning is at hand. Amen. May God bless you. This time we will now have another selection rendered by Mr. Chuck Jennings. I'll get it right. Bear with me. Hope is filled on nothing. 
service this morning. Go in peace knowing that the Lord is upon you and guiding you and will walk with you. And there's no reason why we ought to turn back. Uh, this is a season we can see very clearly that there's a rendering and God is going to be selling some accounts. I want you to be paid in full in Jesus. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face, his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift his up his countenance and be gracious to you and give you peace. Until we meet again. Be blessed. Amen. Amen.